You certainly saw a lot of that last night if you were in Bramlage Coliseum. Tyler Perry had probably his best uh, game when you combine the total points with the efficiency that came from it. He ends up 4 of 10 from downtown, 26 points overall. And honestly, D1 and I talked about it after the game. Maybe the most impressive part of his game last night was he did some things that we hadn't seen him do all year. We had seen him get hot and make threes at different points, and we had seen him be able to distribute to his guys. But he had a couple of big finishes inside with, you know, you, you could say that they were kind of like circus finishes, but when you're a small guard, there is an art to it. And I think he may have started to find the art that comes with getting those shots to fall. I mean, Marquise Noel was fantastic at it. You felt like anytime he drove, didn't matter how it looked or how he put it up, that shot was going in. And last night, Tyler Perry, he found it. And that was a big part of why he was able to do so much last night, where throughout the season, there had been no other element to his game. He found it. He was the big story with 26 points. Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both That is Drew Galloway. Uh, Drew made it back home last night. I said, screw that. I am not driving in the fog and two hours back to Wichita. So I stayed at uh, my brother's house, which coincidentally is the house that I stayed three years in uh, when I was at K-State. And uh, so that's why the background behind me is Less than stellar, but everybody's probably saying, well, the background behind you at your own house is less than stellar, too. So uh, you're not missing out on much there. So there you have it. Uh, also, less than ideal conditions. If at times the sound sounds like crap from my end, it is probably because of this mic. Very touchy for some reason on StreamYard when we're doing things. It's fine on the uh, on the instant reaction stuff when we have the mic. But for whatever reason, I remember when we were in Lubbock and we were recording after that big win. Yeah, like, oh, mm, this thing, and we got a lot of like just touchiness going on. And Drew and I were on opposite ends of a conference room, all these weird things. Uh, fortunately, that is not the case here. And we got to start with really just the simple stuff. K State wins last night 75 to 70 in overtime. A pretty impressive showing for Jerome Tang and his team. Here's a question, Drew, because we'll get into the game by game stuff right now. Let's just start off hot and heavy. What does this mean for this team moving forward now since they're back to 5-5 five and five in Big 12 play and they just netted another quad one win? I, I think the big story of what this means, and it's kind of stealing a page from John Rothstein a little bit, K-State is now in position to be in position. Last week was about as bad as it gets when you lose a gettable game against Oklahoma. You lose an extremely gettable road game against Oklahoma State. So this was a, a win that kind of keeps the tournament hopes alive, but you still have work to do. And I know that you guys kind of touched on it in the incident reaction of they still need to probably get to 9-9. Nine and, nine. And, and if you look at the remaining schedule, 9-9 nine nine probably gets it done because I, I was trying to feed you guys the, the, the stat that Every game outside of the TCU game at home in West Virginia at home is a quad one game. So you, you look at it, and if K-State manages to win four or five more and defends home court, they're at least going to be in position to maybe go to Dayton in the NCAA tournament for the first four. So you look at it, and it kept the season alive. And, and this was a game that I think K-State just needed for or from a morale standpoint, it, everybody was pretty down in the fan base after the last two weeks. And, and it, it seemed like this needed to happen to get everybody kind of back on track. And, and you, you look at going forward on Saturday, and I know that we'll probably touch on this a little bit later, BYU extremely high in the net ranking, but I, I'm just, I'm not like sold on them being that high when it comes to just like all around as a team. I, I think that's an extremely gettable game as well. Yeah. I don't think the BYU game should be out of question for, for K state or on anybody's radars. I mean, none of these games were because look, K state had not played very well. The last four games, they played like a bad basketball team, really the last three, the Iowa state game, they played like the team we had seen to start Big 12 play. But this team does have so many flaws that if they are if they aren't executing and they they aren't able to put some of those behind them during the game, 
they are going to get beat and it may not be the prettiest thing. And I, I said after the game last night, there was one positive from the Oklahoma State game that was a step in the right direction. And we talked about it, but they finally got a game where their big three guys stepped up in scoring and they combined for 50 points against Oklahoma State. But the only thing that was missing in that game was the fact that the defense was putrid. There was no effort. There was no energy. They were just lacking a lot defensively in that game, and it cost them. But last night, they got back-to-back -back games now out of their big three with major performances. Those top guys combined for 58 points last night, 58 of the 75 against KU. And in addition to that, the defense was – back to the level that it had been the first five games of Big 12 play. I saw uh, KSU underscore fan was kind of tweeting out some of the notes uh, on the defensive performance last night for what K-State did against KU. KU's .9 points per possession. It was the second worst for KU this season. It was their worst effective field goal percentage of the year. Worst shooting percentage from three in a game this season at 20%, which – that feels like, you know, some teams really have a game where they bottom out, so 20% you feel like you'd take. They were only 47% from two. It was their fourth worst. Their offensive rebounding rate was second worst of the season, and their rate of getting to the free throw line was their sixth worst. So K-State made life pretty tough on KU in game 23 of this season. It's not like those are a small sample size to pull from. We're deep into the season now. These are real numbers, and K-State's defense was back to a level that was able to pre prevent itself from doing you know, harm to its offense when it was actually there for them. And that's the thing with this K-State basketball team that we've known, is that the offense has some flaws. You lack scoring talent on your roster, and so they don't always quickly capitalize on the ability to go on a run to get you back into the game. Or like we saw last night plenty of times, building a lead or – first and foremost, actually taking that lead when the game is tied or close. It's a little cat and mouse game, but last night, similar to the Baylor game, the defense won out long enough to give K-State a chance to overcome it with their offense. They finally did, and uh, it, it netted a pretty big win for K-State, and you got to finish now. I mean, you got eight games left, and four of the games are at home. Theoretically, win four of them at home, and you feel pretty good, but you could also easily steal one on the road, and you probably need to just because this is a tough league, and Oklahoma's already come in and beat you in Bramlage, so you can't just say, "Ah, we're we'll, we're fine. We're gonna we're gonna win all of our home games." The the net also loves when you win a game on the road, so it, that that would also be huge uh, going forward. Uh, that you said the the defense took a step in the right direction, and it, it really did. It was probably the second or third best defensive game case it's played all season. And, and from a standpoint of like after Saturday, I, I, you just didn't know what to expect on the defensive end, but I'm just like thinking about it right now. There was probably only two or three times all game where you could say, Oh, like that was too easy. Like K, you got an easy bucket. Nothing came easy for KU really. in then, in the entire game, and that's a credit to all five guys on the floor. We're pretty locked in defensively. And Casey might have found something with Jarrell Colbert because he seemed to be everywhere defensively. And, and I'm willing to go as far as to say Jarrell Colbert was probably the second best player on the court when he was when he played last night uh, among both teams because he didn't score, but he didn't have to. He was disruptive. He gave Hunter Dickinson fits and, and kind of set the tone early with, I think it was the first possession KU had. They went immediately to Dickinson and Colbert rejected it. And it, that kind of set the tone of like, hey, this could be a Jarrell Colbert game. And, and it was. And he played huge and was kind of the anchor of the defense when he was on the floor. Well, and that's what made last night so good for K-State's defense is we can look at all these other numbers and as a team they held KU to this and it was it was low for for the season all this other stuff the key for what K-State did last night is uh, I'll throw up the big graphic now kind of showing some of the other numbers from the game and everything and you see Tyler Perry's massive night there but uh, I think it's important to note the field goals taken in this game so Tyler Perry seven of 15 from the floor four of 10 from three those are pretty good for Tyler Perry 
in, in my eyes, that's an efficient 26 for him. But you look at Hunter Dickinson, and we talked about it after the game. D1 and I, we talked about it with you and me. But you you come out of it, and you look down and go, man, Hunter Dickinson had 21 points in this game. Like, he still got his. He still had 21 and 12. So if you look at the vanity stats, Hunter Dickinson came through. But the notable number there is that he was 8 of 18 from the field. And you may say, that's still pretty good. I mean, you're talking about Tyler Perry, 7 of 15. Here's the difference on that. Hunter Dickinson – is the biggest guy on the floor, maybe next to Jarrell Colbert. And he went out there with averaging a 59% field goal percentage on the season. K-State held him to 44% last night. That is significant. Hunter Dickinson normally does not miss as many shots as he did. You made him do that. And similar to that, Kevin McCuller has been a revelation for Kansas this year. K-State, they forced him to miss a bunch of shots. He was 6 of 18 last night. He was just 33%. And that was what was so massive in this game is that scoring wise, yes, the Kansas players still got what they normally did, but they weren't doing it efficiently. And when the top dogs aren't doing it efficiently for Kansas, they don't have enough other guys that can really carry the load, especially when K-State made Johnny Furphy look like a freshman last night. And that's something that teams over the last couple of weeks had struggled to do. And that's another credit to, to what Jerome Tang and his team was able to accomplish last night because it felt like Johnny Furphy had started to figure out the Big 12. Well, last night, K-State proved that there are Big 12 teams out there that can still figure out Johnny Furphy because he's a young guy, just like, you know, Day-Day Ames gets into a lot of trouble at times because he's a freshman. I would compare it to the women's basketball team. Early in their game against KU, it was, and the Texas game before that, it was easy to see like, oh, Taryn Sides going to be a good player. She's a freshman and she makes freshman mistakes. That's just what happens. You have to play good enough, though, to force the freshman to play like that because most of these people I just said, they're talented enough that if you don't go hard enough at them, they are going to make you pay. And the last thing I'll add defensively is you talked about, like, you know, it really wasn't easy anywhere for KU last night scoring-wise. I think the, the only guy that had it easy last night a couple of times, a couple of moments where there were easy buckets was DeWan Harris. But like that's a guy that you can mostly live with that because you're kind of testing the leash of, I dare you to shoot it and see when he will actually shoot it. Uh, I mean, he, that guy has to have nobody within a semi truck of him to actually shoot the basketball. And he would be maddening uh, to watch if he played for K State. It's like, dude, you've got quite a bit of talent, but maybe just uh, step up and take a shot every once in a while. I, I joked last night that uh, I if I was Bill Self, the way I would make my team better right now is I would make uh, I would make Dewan Harris like probably wear like a like a little device that send a little shock through him. You know, like the little shock pins that you would have. Oh yeah. You just have like one of those little buzzers on there, and every time he didn't shoot when he was open in practice, you'd get it and you go, oh. uh, and then be like, okay, I got to shoot. You know, you got to kind of train him that way. Like I don't know what it is at this point because. Like this is props to him. He is a good, he is a good player, and he knocks down shots. And last night, that's another notable thing is KU's record. I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's pretty darn good when when Dewan Harris gets to ten points, and he was efficient last night. Fifteen points, eight assists, three turnovers, um, and he was just five of ten from the the field. The fact that K State was able to get that win like that, it says a lot about how they played and how they were able to shut down the other guys. Because everybody else for KU was pretty solid. I mean, uh, K.J. Adams was 50% from the field, um, but they limited his rebounds to just two. And that's another big thing is K-State out-rebounded KU 43-33 to in this game. Yeah, uh, I got it right here. Uh, Shout-out to John Rothstein again. Yeah, it's two shout-outs in a row for him. Uh, he KU is now a 30-2 and two over the last four years when Dewan Harris scores in double figures. Uh, the first loss was actually last year in the NCAA tournament uh, to Arkansas. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, but to K-State's credit, and like you touched on it a little bit, where uh, on defense, just nobody for KU looked comfortable at any point during the game. Like the, there was a very rare, like uh, KJ Adams was probably the most composed player that KU had on offense because everybody just looked very uncomfortable and K-State was played a big part of that. You could see Hunter Dickinson pressing a little bit. 
by taking a couple threes that he was open, but was that the best shot KU could have gotten? You saw Kevin McCuller kind of press a little bit, and especially at the free throw line, you could really tell that I think he let the crowd kind of get in his head. That's twice in a row in Bramlage where you've seen Kevin McCuller press a little bit because of the crowd. And, and DY was all over this in the pick and preview. That whoever guarded Johnny Furphy needed to have a good game because it seems like if you take him away, you can live with KJ Adams and Dewan Harris being in double figures, but you can't let Johnny Furphy rain threes on you in case they took Furphy away. And the impressive thing to me was it wasn't just the points of, hey, we're not going to let Johnny Furphy beat us. But have you seen his rebounding numbers in the Big 12? He's been one of the best rebounding uh, players in the Big 12 period in conference play. He only had four rebounds last night. Casey out-rebounded KU by 10. This is where it's a little bit maddening because it just happened yesterday. But if Casey can rebound this well in the remaining eight games, there's no reason they can't be in every single game. Because KU is a pretty dang good rebounding team. And K State, for the most part, crushed them on the glass. Yeah. And, and last night, very few moments where you're like, oh, Will McNair had that rebound and then just let it bounce out of his hands or, you know, something like that. Where we, I mean, so many times over this four game losing streak and really all season, there'd be moments where you go, oh, he just, he could have had that. He didn't hang on to the ball. There were a couple moments that looked like it wanted to squirt free, but it never did. Uh, and that that is significant. And I, I will also point this out. The last two years in Bramlage, Dewan Harris has turned the ball over seven times. Now, you may say, okay, four, four last year, three this year. It's not some crazy amount. But Dewan Harris, in his career, only turns the ball over. He turns it over less than two times a game. Now, the last two years, his usage has gone up a little bit. So, it's a little bit higher. He was at two a game last year. He's at 2.3 this year. But that's another significant thing that K-State was able to do last night is that Harris turned the ball over more than what he's accustomed to. And K-State, on the other hand, they overcame their turnovers. I, I think it was a step in the right direction. They only had 16 of them in 45 minutes. But KU turned it over nine times. The Jayhawks, that was really what kept them in this game because K-State won second chance points. They, they out-rebounded KU by 10. It was the points off turnovers, though. KU got 21 of their 70 points off turnovers. K-State only got eight, which, honestly, you see nine turnovers there. That's actually uh, not horrendous for them that they were able to capitalize eight times. And one of those uh, points was a free throw. So it was you know a, a str strung out over a handful of possessions. But K-State found a way in, in this. You know, I, I like what Jerome Tang said last night, is that this team told on themselves with how they played in that game. And now they got to go out and do it over these final eight because the team that played last night is the team we talked about after the first six games of the year where you feel like they could put something together and go on the run. Now they just have to decide, you know, are you going to be like the 2022 team that the opportunity was right there in front of them? They, despite the record and all the struggles through that season, they were winning enough. They had enough quality wins on the schedule that if they played decent basketball down the stretch, they were going to be an NCAA tournament team. That team, it did not go well. It, they they stunk down the stretch. Now, they played some tight games. They just lost games that you absolutely can't lose. This team now has to go out and get those wins. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what they bring to the table against BYU on Saturday night. Yeah, it, it'll be an interesting game Saturday. And if you haven't watched BYU yet, like, they are not afraid to shoot the three ball. I, I think that they're up to like. I love it. I think yeah, they're they are the perfect Mason votes basketball team. I I, I believe it's like fifty five percent of their shots come from three. So the defense will need to be there again Saturday night at a nine p.m. tip. So everybody get your coffee ready or your energy drinks ready because it's it could be a, a late night Saturday night. Straight water for me. <laughs> I, when I would do radio uh, in the morning, six to nine, uh, we, you know, I'd get in there and we'd, sometimes we'd have people in the studio and they'd ask like, well, what's in your cup? Like, what do you, it's just like water. It's, like, water. Do coffee or like something with caffeine. I'm like, nope, 
just water. So I guess the trick is, is, is you put enough ice in there, it gets cold enough. Maybe that is a little shock to your system to keep you awake. Uh, there you go. Just like coffee or something. But yeah, the game against BYU is now all of a sudden back to being huge for K-State. And uh, BYU, they've played well at home this year. Like they have some good wins at home, but they also have shown some struggles there. They're, they're not immune. They have lost games at home. They lost the opener to Cincinnati at home in Big 12 play. They also lost at home to Houston. Um, there are other home showings, though. They, they beat Texas and they beat Iowa State, both by double digits. So you really don't know what you're going to get from them. They are on the road tonight at Oklahoma. Uh, so it'll be kind of fascinating to see uh, what comes about there. Yeah, th this is just more of a point in general in the Big 12. Uh, tonight, there's some interesting games. Uh, Iowa State at Texas, Texas Tech at Baylor. Uh, but you you look at BYU and how massive of a game this is. I mean, BYU is number nine in the net. Like if K-State can pull this one off, especially on the road, you'll see more of K-State either in like as the last team in the NCAA tournament field or the first team out. Because this that's a game where you win it and you're going to shoot up the net rankings because you won on the road which is where a little bit of the frustration comes from losing at Oklahoma State, because even though they aren't very good, it, it would have been nice to win on the road because it increases your net ranking so much. And just not get a bad loss. Well, yes. And then to avoid the bad loss, because that's a loss where you wonder if K-State does get to the 9-9, if the Oklahoma State loss is what keeps them out? Or does the USC loss keep them out? Because you got to remember yeah. that K-State probably needs to be rooting for USC down the stretch to make sure that that doesn't get to a quad three loss, which is insane to say. And, and it's it's on the brink right now. USC's 97 in the net. And, and so based on the way they're trending, that will probably jump out of there at this point, uh, which, you know, is is tough. And, and then... Villanova and Providence, your wins that were good in the non-con, um, injuries and other things have gotten to them. That, those are pretty much, I'd say those are likely to stay locked into quad two at this point. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to be like, I, I keep seeing shout out to to uh, fellow K-State JMC alum uh, who I had many classes with, Greg Woods, who covers Washington State uh, <laughs> now. And Washington State is a team that's fighting for a spot in the NCAA tournament. He keeps tweet, tweeting every other day. It's like, oh, these two wins, they fell down to quad two again. Oh, they're back up. Washington State gained quad one wins overnight. K-State is not in that position right now. Their season is pretty cut and dry with the games that they have. They are either going to win a quad one game or they're going to lose some quad two games. Yeah, the I said last night kind of made a joke that the Providence-Villanova game was probably the worst possible outcome that K-State could have had because Providence wins that game. That game probably could have moved or crept up to quad one territory and maybe it's been a quad one game uh, with Providence on the road at Villanova, but instead Providence got blown out. So now Villanova is still kind of in that in-between and Providence is even further from being a quad one game. Here's what I will say, and I, I said this last night. We, we've learned this now. We've known it in football for a long time. Uh, as the the SEC has shown us, and now we see it in basketball, there is really no point to scheduling good teams in your non-conference or what you think will be good teams because we see teams like Iowa State and BYU who played nobody in the non-con that you know people are saying gamed the net. Maybe maybe they are. I just think they're like you know at the end of the day, wins look a whole heck of a lot better than losses to good teams. Nobody's going to question if you finish non-con, you know. Uh, 13 and 0, and you you only played like two top 100 net teams. I think that basketball is the same way because K State they went out and they thought they put together a pretty good schedule this year. We thought USC was going to be good. They were preseason top 25. Uh, you go in Miami preseason top 25, maybe close to preseason top 10. Coming off of a Final Four appearance, a lot of their guys come back. They look good early in the year, and just like USC, they start to 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 tank and last night was terrible for Miami they got blasted by Virginia um I think 62 to 38 was that the final score there uh or 60 to 38 uh, something like that Miami did not reach 40 yeah, points Miami which 40 
Yeah. So um, that's that's something. And you just look around and then like the good wins for K-State, Villanova and Providence, those like that's tough because those teams either got hit with injuries or whatever. And like their schedules or their seasons have taken a weird turn on them. And like it just it just shows that like it's so random and weird things can happen that it's not worth it because I think there are a lot of teams right now that would have thought K-State would have been a good win for them early in the season. And now they wake up every morning like, oh my gosh, we lost at net 79. Like this is terrible for our resume if we're Providence or Villanova. So I think that's one of the, my big takeaways from what we're seeing as this season plays out. There's no benefit to it. Play, play some locally significant games. So like K-State played Wichita State and Nebraska in the non-con. I think those are fine, but there was no benefit to them playing that game against USC. Now there was zero, and yeah. the you know the midseason tournaments like you're just the MTEs. You, you're you're at the peril of whoever else is there. So I get it, uh, but it just is unfortunate the way it's played out for K State. And then you know they didn't do their own job when it came to to taking care of business against the the quad four teams that were really bad most of the time. So I'll at least say that it it's hard to get a good schedule with a home game which is kind of i don't want to say my biggest gripe with the net because you should reward teams that went on the road but it it sucks that with how the net works it's it caters more to teams that will play a neutral site non-conference game because it, it sucks from a fan perspective because you don't necessarily get good teams to want to go on the road anymore. Uh, so like you don't get like a fun uh, non-conference like home game, like Michigan state Baylor this year was played in Detroit instead of at uh, Michigan state. It's like from that perspective, I think that's where the net kind of sucks and where it'll be interesting to see how K state schedules moving forward, because I know that they want, big teams to come in uh the non-conference play because i uh, next year uh lsu and i think lsu and cal both come to k-state and the both of those games kind of seem like uh you need lsu or or cal or both to really improve for that game to really mean something because i, I believe the lsu game uh next year would be a quad two home game if LSU is how they are right now. So that that's just tough from that perspective. I think of it, it doesn't really benefit you. Used for you. That would be a quad three game. Oh, that's a quad three. That would yeah. Be LSU is 93 in the game. net. Yeah. So that'd be a quad three game. If that was played Manhattan this year. Yeah. So like you don't really get the benefit of scheduling a home non-conference game. And LSU. keep in mind that they also next season have Cal coming. To yes. Manhattan, and that's their net one twenty five right now. So, like, this is not uh that this is not good for K State with the way that the the non cons are working out. Now, like at the end of the day, if you win those games, it's fine. It doesn't matter. All this other stuff, and I like I don't think those teams are good enough. Maybe LSU next year. It'll be what the their third year with Matt McMahon. Um, there are there are moments where you think, hey, maybe they're piecing this together. I'm not too worried about Cal. It's it's when you schedule teams that you think, hey, they might be good or whatever else, and then they, you know, they can flounder. There's just like there's high volatility the teams at K State had on there where you thought they were going to be good. Miami's a weird one because they should be better. Like Larinaga's been solid down there. They returned a bunch of guys from last year. So like, what's the deal? USC's the one though that it's like that's tough. I get what you're doing, and I would never say no to that. Like you get to play in a in an opening event. You, it was it was good for the most part, but it was in the grand scheme of things for tournament resume. The USC loss right now is trending towards being a a bad, a, loss. A bad loss. So which, uh, which it's just kind of tough how it works out. I, I, like USC was good enough in the preseason, I thought to even be in the top ten, and and they looked it. like it in that game against K State. I just I, I'll I'll say this and then let you, you take over here. But like I told fan this when we were driving back from the, the Pop Tarts Bowl, I said, "Look, I I think USC is a prime example of 
as the season went on and got longer and they spent more time together, it was worse for them yeah. because they started to realize finally that, oh, we only get to play with one ball during the game. And you have Boogie Ellis who returned, but then you brought in Isaiah Collier who thinks he's going to be a lottery pick, like all of these different things. Those are already two guys. And then like, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, project this personality wise onto to these guys, but like, you think Bronny James showed up there and is just like, oh yes, I I would love to play fourth fiddle on this team. You know, like, no, not 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 at all. Like they had good returning players from a solid team last year, and they brought in some very, very notable freshmen. And I think that's probably what has done USC in. And now all those guys are getting hurt. So like they have just zero chance. But yeah, that that's a game where I, I think when you play teams is really important. When K State played KU last night was extremely important. It didn't play, it wasn't the reason K State won, but having KU come off of the high of beating Houston and then going on the road to K State is probably a good time that you want to play them, just like how Baylor probably isn't playing KU at, at a good time on Saturday, I would say. Uh, but like, it feels like K State got USC at a bad time because it, it was game one without Naquan Tomlin. It yeah. was game it was game one with the five out offense. So you didn't really know what to expect from K State going into that. It was also game one without Quest Glover. So that's a game where I think if that game would have been like two or three weeks later, K State probably wins. But because you played them opening night you end up losing and now that's turning in the direction of a quad three loss. But I will say though, that it, if they win enough of these games and I hate to sound like a broker record again, but if you take one of them on the road, I, I don't know if it's going to be as bad of a loss as like beating BYU Saturday would be at home or uh, out on the road. And, and I mean, the, a potential sweep of BYU would also go a long way. Like the the way that the Big Twelve is structured, every game from here on out, outside of the West Virginia game, it is a pretty quality win. So you hope that you can get that you can maybe sweep the rest at home, and if especially if you take one on the road while winning. All the rest of the home games, I think K-State is in solidly and probably doesn't have to go to Dayton. But 9-9, nine nine, I think, is probably a first four kind of uh, finish to the season. Yeah, look, the opportunities are there. I, it's going to be kind of interesting to see if they go out and take them and if this was the the, the jumping off point. I, I do think it, it is significant that we saw back-to-back -back games now for the big three guys to step up offensively. And this is the kind of win that can... Like you had all the motivation in the world from last night with all the different circumstances, but the way they played, you would hope that that's the thing that triggers like, okay, hey, the offense is here for us right now. If we just provide the defense again, like we can buy back in and get that, that sets K-State up and, and we'll see how uh, it ends up going. All right, uh, closing things out here. What was uh, your biggest takeaway or your favorite moment from last night in Bramlage Coliseum? Oh, uh, I actually got this question uh, on my way home. Uh, my girlfriend asked, like, what was your favorite part of the game? And, and, and said, I, oh, oh, you know, being with my friends. I, I, I feel like that's the answer that uh, that women are always looking for is they want, you know, like, oh, yeah. And then you're like, oh, actually, we didn't really talk. We just sat there by each other. I, I, I laughed and said uh, when when it was over because I said that my heart rate. I'm glad that I wasn't wearing like an Apple Watch or something because I think it would have said that my heart rate was like at an unstable level. Uh, it was one. It was for me. It was like the how you thought about the KU football game where as soon as it was over, I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> like, yeah, those games are those games really aren't fun in the moment, but then you look back and you go, oh, hey, that was actually pretty fun. Uh, I look, I there, I mean, there were some good moments there and everything. Um, certainly my favorite though, uh, is after the game when, uh, Hunter Dickinson Ooh, is, yes, <laughs> is asked about, uh, his, his foul call that he got at one point in the game. And 
he basically explains exactly uh, like what you do to get a foul call. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd have to, to go look for the exact quote because I don't want to misquote him here uh, because it was a dynamite drop in by him. But uh, uh, well, basically well, talked well, about getting screened and then <laughs> he went and said, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Just go around the guy and admitted to running through uh, the guy that, you know, he got called for a foul on. So that that was just an all time because Hunter Dickinson is pure villain material for college basketball, which is a good thing. And it makes it even better when if you're on the K-State side of this, the the easiest villain in college basketball plays for your most hated rival. That's a good thing for you. And so uh, watching Hunter Dickinson last night like that, I enjoyed. And shout out to my man, Alec Bussey, RIP, not dead. Uh, he he joked before the game last night. He said, hey, if K-State wins tonight, I need, you, I need you to ask Hunter a question for me. I said, okay, I probably won't, but uh, what is it? And he went on some long thing and basically was like, uh, asking why he's never been able to beat his rivals uh, when he's at Michigan or KU now. Lost to K-State, never has beaten Illinois. And I was looking last night, I was like, dude, he's beaten Michigan State and Ohio State before. I was like, I, I'm I'm not trying to gatekeep rivalries here. I'm not that guy for you, but uh, I don't think Illinois, and so uh, Alec was obviously having a good time there, but uh, I, 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 got, me laugh, so. I, I got the uh, the quote here. It Perfect. says, uh, I ran him over. I really don't understand how that can be a foul. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a great point. It makes, makes a lot of sense. I'll also say uh, Sandstorm last night was very good. It was one of the top ones, I think. Mm. Uh, well, let's okay. Let me ask you about this real quick. Uh, let's get the the Drew Galloway on the record official statement on the chant, which made a triumphant return last night, uh, multiple times throughout the game. Uh, where do you stand on the chant? Uh, if if it's against KU, I think the chant is understandable. I mean, we heard Iowa State and Missouri and yeah. KU during football say fk state so like i i don't really see a difference i think it's kind of what makes college sports unique and fun because it's it's not like they're like saying anything like there's no like slurs of any kind that, that's just college kids that seems like a pretty low bar to cross there but i i mean i, I get what you're saying yes on that <laughs> like it I'm I'm more for it. Like if it's if it's a, if it's against KU, I'm fine with it. If it's against anybody else, it kind of does feel a little rent free. But like for me, it's like you can't praise like the atmosphere in Hilton and then like get mad at your own fans for chanting FKU when Iowa State did FK State and F the refs. So yeah, I mean, true. Yeah, the refs got it. So, so for me, it's like, you're not doing anything like that bad. Like there are a lot more things that could be said that like are never said. And it's a good thing that they're not. So yeah. for me, the, the chance fine. I look, I, as, as the father of a daughter, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I, I really can't wait until I can just use my kid to grandstand on, on a lot of things. No, uh, look, I, I, I have no like big issue with it. Honestly, it's another one of those things that like it bothers the heck out of KU people so much that I'm like, heck yeah, give it to me. Uh, and look, it, college students are going to be like this. They are adults kind of living on their own for their first time. They feel like they have all this freedom. Uh, they're going to be pretty vulgar in moments like, you know, and everybody goes through that stretch where it's like, okay, uh, I'm just vulgar all the time. And now it's like, ah, I should probably just do that. Like, you know, in my private space, college kids are not there. They, uh, they fully embrace letting that stuff fly. And, uh, I I'm with you. Like it's really stupid against anybody else that has been quelled. And I would also say that the reason why it was done so many times against other people is because the adults in the room didn't use their brain to think, Hey, you know, the more that we make this a big deal and tell them not to do it, they are going to do it even harder and even more at us. Like just shut up, let them do it during sandstorm against KU and they will not do it at any other point. And they never learned that Jerome Tang came in last year 
got him to stop for a time. But last night, uh, you know, there's a lot of hate in that building for KU, but I think there was also a lot of, I'm not going to say hate, but there was a lot of like, oh, I, I, I hate that I love these guys to it because of how K-State basketball had been playing. Um, so I'm not, I'm not against it. You do it against KU, like it is what it is. Would I, would I prefer like maybe it, it didn't happen, like thinking about, yes, there are kids and everything there, maybe, but also it was 8 o'clock on a school night. So should you really be bringing your kid to that game? Uh, look, you know, I'm not trying to be, you know, backseat parent here or something for you, but I, uh, I, I don't have an overall issue with it. Plus, I mean, to your point, we've, we've heard it from KU this year. We've heard it from Iowa state this year. We've heard it from Missouri. And I, I can remember being a, well, let's see, I would have been a seventh grader when this went on or eighth grader, I guess. And going to the 2011 football game and in the booth uh, and and hearing KU fans after every kickoff yell, rip their effing heads off, which to me seems a lot worse than than a harmless FKU. Um, but I know that KU fans probably had a tough time remembering they even said that because they only kicked off once a game. So uh, a lot of, not, a, not, a lot, not a lot of points on the scoreboard. Up uh, there, so I'm not I'm not anti chant. Do it against KU. Uh, maybe not. I, I mean, it, it happened a lot last night. Um, so maybe it could be toned down to a, just a couple moments. Freak them out pregame, and then a you know a big stretch or two down the end, like sandstorm and everything. But I, I overall, I'm not against it. I'm not going to freak out about it, and I'm not going to clutch my pearls uh, on how that goes down. Because guess what? At the end of the day, uh, kids know all the bad words out there. You just have to be a good enough parent to be like, hey, you know, you don't go to school and, uh, you know, you can say FKU in private or in Bramlage, but you you can't go out there and say, uh, you know, F Mrs. Smith or something at school if, if you don't like what she's doing. So uh, I'll also say, too, that uh, sorry to the Mrs. Smith's out there, <laughs> except, there. except for uh, except for the one that was in in my head there. <laughs> there are, uh, that was the most like. Uh ksu chance to go with the fku chant like it it was probably 60 40 ksu the fku was just <laughs> i don't think there was as many people saying it i think the fku uh, chant was just louder yeah they just had a lot more passion behind it yes because the the 40 that were uh chanting K or the the ones chanting ksu they were like kind of, i would kind of like to be you know like <laughs> the other guys but you know <laughs> Rome Tang told me not to, so I'm going to respect his wishes here. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that's – it's just part of it and everything. The other thing I will say is, I mean, there were some people way up high kind of behind us that were clearly KU fans, but I didn't see a lot of them there last night. Now, now maybe people that were, like, walking around the concourse, you could see it easier and more because, you know, I could only see mainly – in the the arena there and so you know the blue and the dark can maybe kind of blend in a little bit better uh but i thought you know i I'd never at any point thought that it felt like the nebraska game for k-state where it's like where the heck did all these nebraska fans come from uh so i think k-state fans did a, a good job of showing up and i i know people were were freaking out about how many ku fans were going to be in the building it did not seem like there were that many of them no, uh, you asked uh, about the chance, so uh, this is my turn to be the host. Okay, uh, let's do it. Uh, what did you think of uh, no co court storm last night? Uh, I, I have a couple thoughts on it. Number one, I mean, I it's one of those where it's like you're you're not worth our time to storm the court. Like how you know they they beat Texas back in what was that 2010? They didn't storm the court like. The, all these other teams have not gotten that treatment uh, since K-State basketball returned. But it has been reserved for KU. And this falls back in the boat of what I said a couple minutes ago about the chant is, what like, would I prefer that the court storming not happen? Maybe, but I don't really know. The players wanted it last night. And, and my stance on it is this. It bothers the hell out of KU fans so much. They whine and complain about it constantly despite overlooking again the fact of what they do in their own football stadium where it, it, every every win they have you know few and far between over the last decade plus 
they stormed the field against FCS opponents, against group of five opponents, against three and nine Big 12 teams. Um, the one against Oklahoma this year warranted that like that, that was big time for them. Uh, but I I embrace it for K-State. I, I think they should do it every time they beat KU in everything because it just it bothers their their fans so much. Uh, so I would I'm pro court storm against KU. Certainly made our lives easier last night, half not having to deal with it though. Uh, so I do like it from that standpoint. And you know, I'm sure that there's some safety to it, but you know, whatever. Like just have some spatial awareness and and you'll be safe in those moments. So I I get it. I think it's a step in the right direction, but the players wanted it and it it gets those Jayhawks in a tizzy. So uh, I would have I would have enjoyed seeing it again last night. Yeah, see, I I I have mixed emotions too because I think not storming the court against KU is also kind of a power move, but it would have been better if you didn't see the K-State staff kind of shooing the students back and telling them not to. If the K-State students would have just chosen not to, I think KU fans also would have been in a tizzy about how <laughs> about how K-State just chose to not storm the court. Uh, but I also think court storming and, court, or and uh, field storms and everything, like that's what, that's what also makes college sports unique and fun. Like being able to run out there, especially as a student. Yeah. Th- I apologized were... to my brothers last night. I said, oh, sorry, you didn't get your court storm in. <laughs> yeah. Because like th- those are like people that are your own age when you're in the student section. So like it's fun to like celebrate with them on the, on the court. I've uh, stormed the court a couple times after wins over KU. I like guess just a fun thing to do and celebrate. It's horrible when you're actually on the court, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> way too many people. But like, that's what's that's what makes college sports unique. So like, it would have been fun, and the the players wanted it. But I, I will say, like, if K State wins again uh, against KU next year in Manhattan, you need to come to an agreement of, hey, we're not storming the court tonight, and like make this of your own volition or storm the court. Because I'd rather see it come from the students. Well, I think now that it's it's stopped here, I like I don't think you can restart it. You know, like y- you could have made it a thing if you did it again, and you just were like this is what we do against them. It gets them pissed off, and we like getting under their skin. Here we go. Uh, but now that you haven't done it, like y- y- you don't have any reason to do it, unless like you know. For some reason, the Big 12 is like, hey, you guys are going to play the last game of the regular season in, in coming years. And, you know, it's for like a Big 12 title or something. But even that, they do a good job of keeping people off the floor. Like, oh, we got a you know expensive trophy to get out here. And we don't want Bruce Weber getting undercut from his ladder, cutting down the net and everything. Uh, so yeah, could, uh, this is bad. I, I shouldn't say it. <laughs> I like that put the thought in my head of when Ned Yost fell out of his deer stand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So RIP to Ned Yost, not dead, but dead to me because he's overrated as a manager for the Royals. Um, glad he recovered, though, with his uh, – was it Verizon that he had that think, saved his life? I think so. Okay, yeah. So shout out to him. <laughs> this uh, this is a gripe. She won't watch this. Uh, so I feel good getting this off my chest here. I'm still – upset that my wife made me switch over to AT&T from Verizon. So I just wanted to throw that out there, get a little gripe off to the people. Um, because I, uh, th- when I drive to Manhattan now, I get service nowhere. I, it's like, uh, you might have a bar or two. And I, if I call somebody, it's just eh, 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 cutting in and out. I can't, you know, got to make sure I got the podcast fired up before I leave. So like, it doesn't stop Ooh. in the middle of it. So yeah, that, that is it, tough. tough. It's tough being an AT&T guy now. I'm sure it's nice in some spots. It's It's been a life-altering experience in a bad way for me. But <laughs> All right, well, uh, we got to the point where we're not talking about basketball or anything that happened last night, so probably time to shut it down. Cats get a big win, 75-70. to 70. We've got plenty of coverage from the big win over at kstateonline.com, so head over there, and we have plenty of more stuff coming throughout the week. Uh, Be sure to be on the lookout Wednesday morning. We will have some fresh football recruiting news and thoughts for you, Drew and I, right back here with you. Uh, So that will be a positive for everybody. And I guess we'll just kind of see where the basketball season takes us now because last night added another unique turn to it in K-State 
trying to get things back on track, making a case for the NCAA tournament. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching K-State Online. As you can see, my brother's head in the background of the video. Oh, <laughs>